Hey, welcome to a brand new series in the Adventures with Peps YouTube channel. This is going to be the beginner's guide to Judge Dredd the Warlord game. And let's get into it. So welcome to the start of a brand new series where I attempt to explain the Judge Dredd miniature game and tempt you into buying it. Episode one will be a pretty simple starter edition for us. Basically, what do you need to play? The simple answer is... The starter set, I Am The Lord, retails for about 90 US dollars and it has everything you need to play. Included is a soft cover rule book, which uh, last item I checked is 160 pages. It's full color, it's beautiful. Hopefully, if I'm doing this correct, you're going to see some pictures. Uh, we're going to be referring through this book throughout the series. So if you've got it, I'll make sure I'm dropping page numbers in comments and as I'm talking. The rules are written by some rather familiar names. You've got Andy Chambers and Gab Thorpe, who used to be games writers. Andy Chambers obviously did Necromunda. He knows his way around a skirmish game. You also have Roger Gearish. Um, you also get two starter factions, which hopefully I will have painted in time for this video. And we'll try and stage some cool little scene. On one side is the Justice Department, which consists of two judges. Become a judge takes 20 years, and not many last long on the mean streets of Mega City 1. So this is obviously represented in the game with great stats and equipment, like the Lawgiver, and obviously the bikes when we get to the vehicles. This faction has a very low model count, which is shown inside this game, because you only get the two models. One is a street judge, the other is technically a rookie half-eagle judge. There's different ranks within the game that you can play the get models as, and we'll discuss that as we go through. They're facing off against the Block Gang. Now, in this set, it consists of eight models equipped with a variety of weapons, which we will go through each at a later date. These represent your standard day-to-day -day criminals that you can expect to face down as a judge. They come in at cheaper point cost than the judges, but they have lower stats. This is a drawback, but at the same time, you get more bodies. You get a wider range of equipment, and if played right, they can just mob the judges and bring them down by sheer weight of numbers. Also inside the box, you get a double-sided gaming mat, some 2D terrain, which it's fine if you're learning the game. So treat yourself to some 3D terrain. And then obviously the dice and tokens. So that is pretty much it for this introduction. My goal is in the next episode to start diving into the rulebook. We'll look at what you need to play. And we'll start going through what a standard game turn consists of. Hey, Dreadheads, and welcome to episode two of how to play Warlord games. I am the law by Judge Shred. Hopefully, if I'm doing this correct, there'll be a picture here. But let's just get in. We're on chapter one or page, I think it's page six. Let's dive in and we'll start going over the rules. Right, I'm obviously not going to show you every rule in the book, but we are going to read through it and imagery will appear as needed. So overview of the game, Judge Dredd is a tabletop skirmish battle game for two or more players. Players control a small team of Justice Department personnel, block gangers, city death militia, or any number of weird and wonderful factions on the street of Mega City 1. Everything you need to play is described in this book and it also helps you create gangs and factions to play as. How to get started? Start by taking a little time to read over the mechanics and then just play a little game. What do you need? You need two or more players, a playing surface such as a tabletop or unobscured floor space. It doesn't say here but they ideally aim for a 3x3 three three size. You need a selection of Judge Dread models, a tape measure or ruler with a minimum of 12 inches, assorted markers, a variable number of action chips and star chips, which gets explained later, the combat dice, and a six-sided dice. The dice. Judge Dredd uses special six-sided dice, sometimes individually referred to as a die. They are, in this game at least, they're white and red. Each dice comes with three hits, two armor, and one special. These all have different effects in the game. Obviously, the explosions represent you hitting in combat or shooting. Your armor symbol, which is the judge's badge, represents you saving against damage, and the 2000 AD represents anything special you have to try and roll. Unless you're really new to wargaming, 
I think you understand what a six-sided dice is. Sometimes you have to re-roll as well, that will get covered later on. And there's also dice modifiers. When measuring, you measure from the front of the model when moving, and you move it the full distance to the front of the base. This is a very simple rule. A lot of people can get it wrong, but it is you measure from the front and it ends at the front. Shooting is measured from the closest point of your model to the closest point of the enemy model. If you can draw that line, you can shoot. We then get turning and fire arcs. Now this can be iffy. Some players will draw on their bases to represent the front back. Others it's based on which way the face is looking, which I find to be the easier way of doing it myself. You have the front arc, the back arc, the left arc, the right arc, and then you get focused front, focused left, focused right, focused back, which will affect certain things in the game. We also learn about the different markers. You get an action chip. So action chips, every model that's in your force gets an action chip. If they have a certain cool value, you get a star chip. We'll go over that later on in this review, probably in the next section. You then get injury markers that are easy to spot because they have the little medical X. You get pin markers that look like bullet explosions. Stun marker that looks like a dizzy symbol. Moving fast, it's got the wings of Achilles. And then the overwatch marker which has an eyeball on it. Model statistics are very simple. You have move, shoot, fight, evade, resist, cool and notoriety. Move represents how far you can move in inches. Shoot is how well you can fire. Fight indicates how many dice and how good you are at fighting. Evade, once again, how many dice you roll to dodge shots. Resist is your armor rating. Cool is how well you can handle situations like being under fire, being pinned, doing your cool tests. And notoriety represents your power level. Most characters come with a gun or a close combat weapon, depending on how you've armed them, but they all roughly have the same chart, as you can see here. There's a short range normally, which has its own modifier, a long range that has its own modifier, a power level, and any special rules. The range is how many inches it is that you can shoot from. Modifiers show how many extra dice or how many dice you lose when shooting at that range. You then get the power level. So once you've hit someone, that's how many times you roll to see if you've injured them. And special rules tells you if it's got anything special. So the cult lawgiver has armor piercing, special rounds, and a stun pulse, which will all have their rules in the book. Close combat weapons, it's a similar system, has a range. Most close combat Combat weapons will be a one inch range, but there's weapons like whips that might be longer and spears that could also be longer. Most close combat weapons usually give you modifiers very rare that they won't have a modifier of some sort. And then you have the special rule section. And that is where we're going to end this week. Next week we'll go into game turn, which will be a lot longer video. But until then, I hope this was of value and I will catch you soon. Cheers for watching. Hey, welcome to Adventures with Peps, a rookie's guide to I Am the Law by Warlord Games 2000 AD and Rebellion Publishing. We are on part three, which is going to be the game turn. Now, as you can see on the screen, I decided rather than just keep constantly showing pages, you're going to watch me paint some, uh, I think it's Marvel Crisis Protocol terrain. It's not a pretty paint job, hence it's not getting its own video, but I thought I'd have that playing to keep us all interested. And then certain rules, I will just pop up into the video when I feel necessary. So we are starting at page 14 of the rulebook. The game turn. Judge Dredd is played using a system of drawing action chips. You see this photo I'm putting up on the screen. Every model in your group gets one of these tokens. It doesn't matter if they're the leader, a ganger, pack of juves, they'll all get a token. These are all put into a bag and during a turn they are randomly drawn out and depending on whose token is drawn depends who gets to activate one of their models. It's a pretty easy system, it's very similar to what they had in bolt action. They uh, use dice in that version but it's a very clean easy system to follow. If you have 10 models you have 10 action chips. It's as simple as that. If a model is took out of action, you lose the action chip. It stays out of the bag. A person with more chips in the bag is ultimately going to get more chances to play. Then you have certain characters, usually your leaders, most judges as well. They have a cool value of four or more. 
you get what's called a star chip. Now, this chip works exactly the same way as an action chip. Once it's pulled, if it's your color chip, you get to activate a model. The thing that is different about it is that once you've done all your actions with that model, you could do what they call going for broke, which is where you have the chance to roll dice equal to your cool factor. And if you roll the 2000 AD symbol, you get to put the chip back into the bag. Now, this has a lot of advantages. If it's early on in your turn, and you pull out a star chip, and you put it on a model with a nice cool rating, it's worth going for it. Get that chip back in there. The model is freed up as well. You could pull out another different chip, and it could not be a star chip in this example, and that model could use that to move again. So it lets the model continuously move. Now, the issue is, if you fail the roll, that model is automatically pinned. The chip stays out, and the model is pinned. If it's the last chip in the bag, you can continue to put it in, but it happens to then get a minus two to the roll. So unless you've got a really high cool value, it's a big risk. When you've drawn your chip and it's your turn, you choose the model you wish to activate. That model is allowed to do two single actions or one double action. We're going to go over the actions probably in the next video because uh, this is purely about the game turn. Uh, examples include, so a single action could be move and take a snapshot, whereas a double action could be sprint and take an aimed fired shot. So, for example, if you do a double move, you can do your double move. That's where you copy the most models that a human can move five to six inches usually. So a single move would be one action, so you'd move forward five inches. You then, for your second action, could move another five inches, or you could take a snapshot where you just fire your gun. A double action sprint, it's basically your double move plus a d6, so you get to go a little bit further, but it's very random what you can do there. Or the aimed fire shot gives you advantages when shooting, because you've obviously took one action to aim and then one action to fire. Ending the game turn, it's pretty simple. You've pulled the last token from the bag. There's no more action chips left for either side. Every model's done its moves. It's done its actions. You gather up all your action chips. You place them back in the bag. Give it a good shake. Make sure you don't uh, favor one side over the other. Make sure that anybody who has been took out of play has their chip removed. Now, it's very important that if it's a model with a cool factor of four or more, that you remove the star chip. That chip is only in the bag because that character was in the bag. Star chip represents that character's leadership, inspiration, the ability to bark orders, whatever it might be in game terms. So once that model is gone, you have to remove that special chip. You then check to make sure that you've not actually completed the scenario. Sometimes it's a simple thing like steal this objective and get off the table edge. If that's been done, it's game over. You've won. The other player's lost or vice versa. And that also means it's game over. Uh, you can also check to make sure there's no ongoing events happening. This might come in with the more complicated rules if there's gas clouds, uh, zombie hordes, random creatures running around the board, things that aren't controlled by the players necessarily, but have the ability to move around. And then, depending on what game you're playing, you probably have a set amount of turns to get objectives done. And if that has come to an end, it's game over, man. It's game over. So, that is pretty much it for this week. That is a term. We're probably sitting around the seven minute mark, so that's probably long enough for a video to keep you interested. Make sure you watch the first two videos if you haven't. And then in next week's video, we'll actually move into what are the actions. So we'll look at single actions, double actions, uh, a very more, very more great English there more in-depth look of each action type that you can do and 
we'll move in to some harder rules after that. So, as always, cheers for watching. Drop me a comment if I've gone over something and you didn't understand it, or if there's something you need me to delve deeper into. I'm happy to do that. But until then, cheers for watching. Hey, everybody, and welcome to this week's Rookie's Guide to I Am the Law Judge Dread by Warlord Games. Today, we are looking over actions. Actions happen when you activate one of your models, and the way you'd go about that is by pulling a chip from the bag that is to do with your faction, and you pick a model. Now, they can either do two single actions or one double action, and we're going to quickly go through all those actions today. So, nominating actions, you don't need to declare both of the model's actions before undertaking them. This means you could, for example, do your snapshot, see how that goes. If it goes well, maybe you'll move away. Maybe you'll shake it off. Maybe you'll do something else. Maybe you'll take a second snapshot. If you've missed, maybe you'll snapshot the same model. It gives you some flexibility in that sense. You don't have to fully declare what you're doing until the moment is there to declare what you have to do. So single actions, you can move your model. You can snapshot, you can throw a weapon, you can fight, or you can shake off. Double actions include aimed fire, sprint, charge, set overwatch, and hunker down. Let's look a bit deeper into each one. Move. This is the most common used action in the game. Helps you get your models around the table, unsurprisingly. A move action makes you move your model up to its full move stat in inches. Very simple, very straightforward. I believe most models have around a four or five inch move, depending on who they are. You can move up to the full amount of inches in any direction, in any way between that, as long as you don't move further than that. You're also allowed to turn your model as many times as you want so you can like weave around barricades and walls and what have you and you can also move through friendly models without a penalty terrain will have an effect on your move we aren't going to talk about terrain at this time that is a whole later video but pretty straightforward it's similar in almost every game that you play the second single action option you've got is snapshot this allows you to turn in place and fire one of your ranged weapons it represents you firing from the hip with little to no aiming some weapons are too big or slow to reload to take snapshots with and require aimed fire to do this that would be mentioned in the special rules really there's no downside to snapshots you just lose a little bit of a benefit if you took the time to aim, you get more dice to roll. That's really the big difference. If you're a pretty good shooter, you can probably get away with snapshotting all the time. Moving, snap fire, it's a very good combo to do. You have the third option, which is throw, similar to shoot, apart from that you're throwing something, so it could be a grenade, a brick, some form of projectile weapon. Fight is similar to close combat charging, which is a double action. But with the fight, you just move three inches. That's as simple as it is. And then you can strike a model in close combat. So it's a single action. The benefit to that is you could fight twice in a turn if you're close enough to the model to attack them. So if you've ended up close to someone, you move your three inches, fight them. If you haven't knocked them down, you could fight them again. If you do knock them down, you could then move away or shoot somebody. Then the last action is shake it off. This is really helpful. A lot of the time you'll get models who get pinned or stunned either by trying to go for it or they've been hit by a weapon that causes that kind of effect on them. You need to get rid of those tokens quick because it makes your character slower and more vulnerable to being took out of the game. It's annoying when you have to waste an action doing it, but it's very important again. We move on to double actions. These are more complicated versions of single act. So sprint, for example, is two move actions, one after the other. And then if you do that, you get a bonus D6 inches of movement. Downside to doing this versus a double move is that you have to sprint in your front arc only. You gain the moving fast marker, which means you're harder to hit if people are shooting at you, but you do have to run in a straight line. As charge is a double action that works very similar to the fight action, but has additional movement. Charge has to be directed at an opposing model or vehicle in your model's front arc. Roll a d6 and add that to your move. Charging model can move within close combat range, 
i.e. one inch of the target, it can make a close combat attack with a bonus of plus one to its power. You also mark the model with a moving fast marker. You may charge if already engaged in close combat. The moving fast marker and their effects remain in place until next activated. Models may attempt to use charge double actions to break through doors and windows as well, which we'll cover later on. So in the previous one, it was like a tiny move and you get to fight. The benefit of that is if you're going up against somebody who's slightly weaker, you just go in, you punch them, you knock them out, they're finished. You can then go on to do something else. Whereas charging, you may want to call that if the model you're going up against is at full health. Maybe you know you're not going to take them out this turn, but having those extra dice to knock them down with is extremely helpful. Aimed fire resolved in a very similar way to snapshot. You turn the model in place to aim it at the target you're firing at. Make sure the model you are aiming with is got the opposing model in its front fire arc and then you get plus two combat dice to either its shoot stat representing you being careful at aiming or the weapon's power representing aiming for a vulnerable spot that's really good if you're in a good spot and you don't need to move aim fire set overwatch this one is quite helpful if you're in a good spot maybe you've got a model with a rifle and he's looking down the street but there's no one currently in the street you can set them in overwatch so you turn the model in the direction it's facing put a little overwatch marker next to it and if an enemy model moves within your front firing art and it's within range of your weapon, you are allowed to do a snapshot. So that also includes sprint and charge and the overwatch is always a snapshot. That represents somebody running into your view, moving in. Any other type of action has happened. So you can go in overwatch and there's somebody in the street already. But you're waiting to see what they're going to do. Maybe they declare they're going to throw a weapon. You're allowed to take an aim shot at them. So this represents you waiting for them to come out of cover to do that throw. You take the shot. You get a little bonus for the aim to fire. You then remove the overwatch marker from the model because it's taken its turn. If an overwatched model becomes pinned, stunned or inca incapacitated before using the marker, it loses its marker. Otherwise, it remains in place into the next game turns or until the overwatched model activates or takes a different action. Then the last of the double actions is hunker down. This is also a double action. allows you to get rid of some of your injuries. So you roll a d6, add that to the score of the model's move stat, minus any stun marker or injury markers. The model can then move this total distance in any direction, providing it ends up no closer to the nearest enemy model. If the model moves into cover, you can roll a number of combat dice equal to its original unmodified resist stat. Each armor result rolled, the model removes one injury marker down to a minimum of one. You can't fully remove all injury markers, but you can get yourself back down to one, which is quite nice and it'll keep models in the game for longer. So that's all your actions, but I'm hoping we'll get a battle report in soon and you can see that in action. Welcome rookies to this episode of Rookie's Guide to I Am The Law. We are on ranged attacks and we will be covering pages 20 to 23. In order to make a ranged attack, a model must have a target within a range of the weapon it's using, within its line of sight, and within the fire arc of the weapon it is using. Picking a target, it's pretty straightforward. You pick your target, you point at it, you say I'm shooting at you. You then check your range and line of sight. If you're using a one-handed weapon, you can assume it's your front arc. It's a two-handed ranged weapon. It's a focused front. It's a heavy weapon. It's focused front. It's worth remembering that the front arc is the front 50% of your base if you cut the base in half, whereas your focused front is roughly a quarter of the front. Line of sight, you have to basically draw a line between your model's base and the target model's base. If there's any terrain or models that are in the way that are taller than both the target model and the shooting model, line of sight is blocked and a different target must be chosen. To hit a target, you roll a number of combat dice equal to the firer's shoot stat, as we mentioned earlier. You then add any modifiers that may be in effect. These include the range modifier, there's plus minus. Target is a vehicle or a mounted model, you get plus one. The target is moving fast or has a fast moving marker, minus one. The attacker is within close range of the target, minus one. If any hit results are scored in the dice, the target has been hit. Zeros are not heroes. If modifiers reduce a model's stat to zero, they have no chance of hitting the chosen target and have to select a different target or give up the idea of shooting. This is, you can't 
have people shooting and killing if they're at zero dice. I like that rule. You don't get have a free shot, even if you're in negatives. Taking hits. If the number of hits rolled equal or higher than the target school stat, the target is pinned in addition to any other results of the hit. The effects of being pinned start your turn. You have to roll a special one versus your school stat. Otherwise, you have to use shake it off later in your turn. You can only ever be pinned once. If you're already pinned, you do not receive another pin marker. Dodging hits. Now, you've been hit by a weapon. The defender gets to try and dodge. They roll a number of combat dice equal to their evade stat. If any special results are rolled, the hit is dodged and entirely ignored. You get minus one if they're using an incendiary weapon like a flamer, or you get plus one if they're using a blast weapon like a grenade or a missile launcher. If a model successfully dodges the incoming attack, the owning player can move their model three inches in any direction and change its facing as desired. Note that some blast weapons have a blast so large that they are not able to fully escape even if they dodge successfully. Let's pretend you've been hit, you failed to dodge, now what happens? You try to resist it. This represents your armor. If a hit isn't dodged, you roll a number of combat dice equal to the weapon's power stat to determine the power of the hit. Result equals one power. Any other result equals no effect. The target rolls a number of combat dice equal to its resist stat. You get plus one if the attacker is using two or more weapons, plus one if the target is in light cover, plus two if the target is in heavy cover, or minus one if you are shooting them in the back. For each armor they roll, you reduce the power of the weapon's attack by one. Now an important thing to remember is cover. Any weapons used in Mega City 1 are powerful enough to punch through barriers on a direct hit. Now the rules for cover is pretty simple. If the attacker's line of sight crosses any kind of cover, the defender can claim light cover. So there's a bench in the way, that's light cover. But if the defender is touching the bench, they can claim heavy cover. Light cover gives them plus one resist, heavy gives them plus two. Super, super simple. But for something to be counted as heavy cover, it needs to be of a tough material, i.e. metal, concrete, or plastic. Lightweight materials such as plastic, wood, glass, they're only at best going to give you light cover. So use a little bit of common sense here. Maybe chat things over before you start rolling dice, because some people might think that's going to give them heavy cover. Others would argue it'd be light cover. Don't fall into the trap of having arguments during a game. It's meant to be fun. So you've done your resists, some shots have gone through, you now work out what's happened. So if your power, so the power is your leftover hit dice, once all said and done, if you've got minus one or less, no effect. You completely whiffed your shot. If you've got zero, the target gets a stunned result, which they then receive a stunned marker. All stunned model stats, including move, are reduced by one for each stun marker they have sustained until the model uses shake it off to remove the stun markers. You then get, if you got one, you are injured. You place an injury marker on the target model for the rest of the game. All model stats, including move, are reduced by one for each injury marker it has. Injury markers can be removed by taking a hunker down double action. If you scored two hits, you've seriously injured the target. You place two injury markers on the target model. All injured model stats are reduced by one for each marker they have sustained. Blah, blah, blah. Same as injured previously. It's exactly the same, but you get three injury markers this time. Injuries will accumulate on a model and beyond a certain point, the model will be classed as incapacitated and out of the game. If the model has so many stunned and or injury markers that its cool stat is reduced to zero, it counts as incapacitated meaning it's unconscious or dead, and is at least temporarily out of the game. Models that are incapacitated do not put their action chips back in the bag and can take no more actions. Some armory card, big mech cards, or certain skills can be used to retrieve the model, so please leave them on the table. A model that has been reduced to zero cool by stun markers only is said to have been subdued instead of incapacitated. This is important to note for when you are sentencing your perp. I've never actually done that, but that's like a campaign rule. We'll maybe cover that at a later date. That just means they could have been arrested so they can escape maybe from the jail or you could rescue them from the rival gang. And then we're pretty much at the end of range. There's just one special rule to go over and this will only affect the judges to begin with and special characters. If you've given them the gunfighter skill, if they successfully dodge the attack with the special result dice, they get to shoot back. But in order to shoot back, the model must not be pinned, must have the attacker in its front fire arc, 
So when you do your dodge, you move three inches and turn them. Make sure you turn to face the person who shot at you. And obviously you have a ranged weapon that can be used for a snapshot. You then basically roll the attack and shoot back straight away. Sometimes this could lead to what's called bullet time, where both models have the gunfighter skill. And if they're good enough, you can just keep rolling specials and shooting back and forth. And it's pretty cool to watch, but it's rare when it will happen. And that's it. That is ranged rules over with. Next week we'll do close combat. And then I think we're ready for a game after that. I think, yeah, we could probably move into a game after that because this vehicle's followed by terrain and we can worry about that stuff as we come to it. So I'm excited we're getting close to a battle report. Hope you're enjoying. Hope you like. Drop me a subscribe and all that good stuff. If you got any questions, drop them in the comments below. Hey, welcome to this week's Rookie's Guide to I Am The Law, Judge Dread by Warlord Games 2000 AD. So this week we are diving back into to the game we are looking at close combat we are covering pages 24 to 27 this will probably be the last chunk of this and we'll get into the beginner games because we'll probably have enough rules under our belts to do this so close combat models that are within one inch of each other are within close combat range this represents blades blunt objects fists teeth there is a minus one penalty to shoot at close combat range so if you're within one inch there's really no point in shooting unless you're seriously bad at close combat and you cannot aim fire when you are in this range makes sense Overall, most of the time, it is the better option to fight, grapple, batter the offending party. So the fight action, you declare either a fight action or a charge action, which can bring the active model within close combat range of the enemy model. You roll to hit in the enemy. It's pretty much the same as shooting. You roll a number of combat dice equal to your fight value. If the target is already pinned, you get plus one dice. You are attacking the model from behind, plus one. You can't start your turn in front of a model and then run behind it. Successive rains of kicks or blows can suppress an enemy just as much as a hail of shots. If you roll number of hits equal or greater than the defender's call, they suffer a pin result. Exactly like shooting. If you've hit, the defender can attempt to dodge. You roll number of combat dice equal to the evade. If any special results are rolled, the defender has dodged. Once again, exactly like the shooting face, this is very, very simple. If you successfully dodge, you get to move three inches. This should be used to move you out of close combat unless you think you can batter your opponent in return. If you fail to dodge, you then roll your resistance. Right, resisting hits. If the hit is not dodged, add the attacker's close combat weapon modifier to the attacker's spite to determine the power for resolving the hit. If the model has no melee weapon, it just uses its fight stat. Then you apply the following modifiers. So obviously fight plus any weapon modifiers. And then if the attacker used a charge double action, it gets plus one. The attacker rolls a number of combat dice equal to the power stat. Any hits equals one power, and the other two results are useless in this effect unless there's some special rules. Total up the number of hits. The target model then rolls a number of combat dice equal to its resist stat. This can be modified by, very simply, it gets minus one if you're being attacked from behind. For each armor rolled, you resist the hit. Count up how many are left and see what happens. If it's minus one or less, there's no effect. Zero, you get a stun result. One, target is injured. Two, target is seriously injured. Three, grievously injured. Exactly like Newton when that all comes into play. So we won't go over that again. You can go back to the shooting video. Subdued in combat. A close combat attack made without any certain weapon. So this includes just your fists, feet or head. Is considered to have a stun special rule. E.g. the attacker has the option to inflict at least one stunned result and count all injuries as stunned. However, close combat weapons without the stun special rule may not be used for subduing in this reason. Multiple opponents. Multiple attackers ganging up on one single opponent will happen quite a lot. They ultimately do get in each other's way though, so there's no bonuses for being outnumbered. The one exception is that models that operate impacts such as juves score hits on both hit and special results if at least one other member of the pack is also within close combat range. Close combat attacker with multiple enemy models in range can elect to split its fight stat in order to attack more than one model. At least one point of fight must be assigned to each model. But ultimately, they won't get any bonuses. So, for example, three punks are attacking my judge, they're not going to get bonuses. If it was three juves that form a pack, they would get bonuses, but it's nothing to be scared of because they're not very strong, so it probably won't hurt you. But they're more likely to hit, but less likely to actually damage your character. But the bonus of doing that is 
that when the judge swings back, he has to divide up his points. So if the judge only has three fight and he's fighting against three people, he's got to put one on each, which lowers the chance of him hitting. That is pretty important. Escaping close combat. A model within close combat range of the enemy is allowed to move away using move, sprint, or charge. Compare the active model's move to the models that are in close combat. Any enemies with a higher move stat than the active model can make an immediate close combat attack against the fleeing model. You can run away, it's just dangerous for you. We also have the two weapon fighting rule. The model can attack with a close combat in each hand, providing that both weapons are one-handed. When a model uses two close combat weapons in this way, it will score hits on the target with hit and special. It's similar to a pack. Results of these aren't as strong as a normal fight, so your opponent will gain a plus one resist dice. This represents you not getting as big of a swing going because you're concentrating on trying to use two. Having a pistol in one hand and a close combat weapon in another also counts for this rule. Power for close combat hits uses either the model's fight stat plus modifiers and special rules for one of its close combat weapons, or you can use the pistol's power and special rule. If the attacker is splitting their fight in order to attack multiple opponents, only one opponent can be attacked with the pistol. So a judge has a day stick and a pistol, the lawgiver. When fighting in close combat, you could elect just to use the day stick. If you do that, normal fighting, only hit on hits, but you end up having a plus one modifier and you can use the stun special rule if you're just doing day stick. You could use the lawgiver. The lawgiver would be power for armor piercing special rounds and a stun pulse. So you have options, or you could use both. If you're going to use both, you can hit on a hits and 2000 AD symbols, but your opponent gains plus one resist. Final rule to go over is the brawler skill. This is very similar to gunfighter, but it's the close combat version. When you roll to dodge, if you roll a 2000 AD, you get the fight back. And once again, similar to gun time in the shooting phase, if your opponent also has brawler and rolls a 2000 AD, you can go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, beating up each other. That is it for this episode. Hope you enjoyed. Hope I brought you something. But drop me a comment, drop me a like, all that good stuff. And we'll have a battle report next week. And then as we progress through the battle report, we'll start learning about vehicles and terrain. So I hope you've enjoyed. Hey, Dreadheads, we are finally on to the battle report. We've done well as the rookie. We're finally getting to go onto the mean streets. We're going to kick off with Sugar Rush. I have played that once before on this channel, but I thought it was worthwhile doing again. So let's dive on over to the board. We are playing on a 3x3 three three board, which has been laid out to have this 12 inch wide street. The perps will set up in the middle and the judge will try and come on one end and the gangers have to escape from one end as well. It's pretty straightforward. In the game we have the street judge who is armed with a lawgiver, a day stick and a boot knife. We then have the high roller block kick gang who is a gang punk with pistol and knife. Gangpunk with pistol and chain. Gangpunk with a sawn off shotgun. Special rules. To deploy the models, you gotta set them up in the middle within six inches. Then the judge, he starts on one table edge, one inch away from said edge. The gangers get stims and smoke bombs, along with one hell of a shot and bring it on. Whereas the judge starts with stun gas, ricochet, the luck of Jovis, and munch for brains. Now, there are a couple of special rules that we'll go over. First up is surprise creep. The high rollers have been caught off guard before the game starts. You can nominate one model to have a pin. You then get backup once the first punk has been took out of action. A second or fourth punk will appear with a stump gun and they start behind the judge. We also have the busy street rule. When you're trying to sprint, you roll two dice, you take the lowest result, and if you happen to roll a double, you only use your move characteristic. The judge is unaffected by this because he knows the streets so well. Leaving the table. Easiest way to leave is straight off the end via the road. But if you decide to go a different way, you have to roll a dice. If you roll a hit, it can move off the edge and they're good to go game length. The game continues until all punks have left the tabletop or have been incapacitated or subdued. The objective of the high rollers need to escape without being apprehended. Trading in illegal substances can get you 30 years in the cube. If two punks out of the original free escape, that's the important part, they claim victory. If the judge manages to incapacitate or subdue two or more punks, any punks, 
he wins. So you, the judge has to focus on these first three models. Focus on anyone else and you will lose this game. It is not an easy game to win. So you have to be focused. Turn one. Right, we are diving in. Let's go, go, go. Turn one. Pull out the judge's chip. Good start. We always need the judge. So each turn you get to do two actions, either two quick ones or one long one. So quick action number one for me is going to be moving the judge forward. I want to get close. I want to start shooting. I'm too far away. I don't want to rely on long shot. I move forward, give him a little turn, and then we are going to snap shoot. Check the range. I am within short range. Street judge has shoot four. So I start off with my four attack dice and because I am close range, I get to roll an extra one. We are looking for hits, just hits at this point and I score a few now. Under normal circumstances, I've rolled enough hits to pin the model, but I am shooting at the model with pin already. You can only be pinned once. So sadly that gives me no bonus at this round, but that was a great opening shot. With the pins not doing anything, we move on to evade and our guy has an evade of two. We are looking for 2000 ADs and we got one. So the Judge Kinsey's first shot completely whiffed. Absolute whiff job. No damage, no issues. We can move on. At this point, I've got to decide, do I risk the star chip? What that means is we roll against the Judge's cool value. If we get any 2000 ADs, we can put the chip back into the bag. With a cool of four, Seems like a good chance, but I completely whiff it once again. Now, because Kinsey just failed, he gets a pin token of his own, and that is the end of his turn. Basically, the rest of turn one is now the gangers. This is a rough start for Judge Kinsey. Very rough. So it will come as no surprise that the next chip out of the bag was a red one. Seeing the judge pinned, the blocker with pistol and chain is going to try his luck. Now, a smart man would be running for the exit, but that's really boring. I don't want to have a boring battle report It'd be over real quick if those two just ran off on this first turn, because they could get a decent run move and they're off the table. That is the downside of it. But I want to show a few moves. So we're going to walk him around. He's heading towards some cover over here. Now he's going to take a snapshot at the judge who is currently pinned. Basic shoot of two, close range, plus one. So we're on three dice looking for hits and we get two. That's not enough to affect Kinsey's cool, but he's already pinned already. So nothing would happen there. Time for the judge to evade. He is only two on evade and fails. Ugh, Kinsey, this is not going well. The pistol has a strength of three. I said strength should be power. So we got one hit out of the three dice. We now look at the judge's armor value, which is a solid free. We're looking for a couple of shields. We get one, one shield. That neutralizes that, but it leaves him on zero, which is a stunned result. Kinsey is in rough shape. He's pinned and stunned. So on his next turn, got hope that you roll a 2000 AD to get rid of the pin marker. And then he has to work out if he's going to try and get rid of the stunned result as well. There we go. Little uh, spinning stars to represent the stun. <laughs> Kinsey is just in trouble. Right, back to the bag. We know what's in here, but I'm going to try and play it properly. Now, we're, we're sensing blood in the water. We gotta move in for this. The stun result makes minus one on all of Kinsey's stats, which makes him a lot more easier to attack right now. So I move, snap fire, three shots. We get a couple of hits, still doesn't beat his cool yet. Judges have a pretty good cool stat. Kinsey is currently a cool four, but three because of the stun. He does roll a 2000 AD to evade though which means Kinsey gets to shoot straight back. It's also at this point I made my first error because he should have been at evade one, not two. The result really wouldn't change because I technically rolled two 2000 ADs, but worth noting, I made an error there. I will make more, that's just life. So Kinsey normally has a shoot of four. 
I am at close range, which takes it up to a five. I can also dodge three inches, which I forgot, which is what brings me into close range. Always worth remembering these rules, but because I have a stun, I lose one dice. So many rules you have to remember, even in like a full model game. There's a lot going on. So because I got the dodge, I got to move three inches. I believe I forgot that on the first turn with the ganger. But I roll a hit, which was all I needed. The ganger has to now try and evade and fails. So no evade. We finally get to see what the lawgiver can do. These are a brute of a weapon with standard ammo. It is a power four weapon. We only get two hits out of four, which is pretty tasty still, because the ganger only has armor two. And he rolls no armor, so we are plus two. That is serious injury table. I mean, and this punk has got two wounds, which is more than its cool value. Having took more injuries than its cool value, he is now incapacitated and has fallen. We are going to leave him in place just so we know where he fell. That is going to activate the additional ganger appearing next turn. If only one chip left in the bag, we know who it's going to be. It's going to be the sawn off shotgun. Put the token down next to him. First thing we have to do is check to see if he becomes unpinned. So, cool of two. Grab the dice. Let's have a roll. Oh, he fails. So his first short action is going to be get rid of that. Now, I could run, but that's boring. He's going to take a shot. We know we got another block ganger coming in. Now the shotgun is a brute of a weapon. I keep calling it a shotgun, it's a stump gun. But it's 10 inch, plus two to hit, power four. If it hits, it knocks back the opponent d6 inches, if not evaded. So this can be annoying. It's great for up close and personal, which you don't always want to be, but it can cause some real damage. So it's hit, hit comfortably with two, because it's two, we don't have to worry about it pinning the judge. So it comes down to the evade, and we are rolling on one dice, and oh my god, it's a 2000 AD. The fact that we got a 2000 AD is ridiculously lucky. So Kinsey gets to shoot straight back. So Kinsey should be a shoot four, close range, making it five, but he has a stun, so he loses one of them. Shooting with four shots, we get a couple of hits, Technically enough to pin it. Looks like I forget that. Whoops. So he doesn't evade. We then roll for power. And we score one. Just the one. Well that's not very exciting. We are up against the blocker's armor of two. And he doesn't roll any shields. Wow, so he is injured. Gotta give him an injured marker. So we have one ganger incapacitated, one ganger injured, and one ganger perfectly fine, and we also have a ganger about to appear behind Kinsey. So, a little bit of table cleanup, and we will get into turn two. And here we go into turn two, Judge Kinsey. He's got one down and one injured, but they have backup in the form of another punk with a shotgun. He has appeared behind Kinsey. Let's see who's going to come out the bag first. Can't find the chip. Uh, oh, we got the judge. That's good. I don't know why I went. Ugh. It's like I don't want him to win. Right, we have to deal with his market. So starting with that pin result, we got to try and get rid of it. The judge should have a pin of four, but he's stunned. So he's only got three. We roll. He absolutely fits. That is just wonderful. Right, he's got to use his first action to get rid of it. That's super annoying. We are now going to shoot. I forget another rule here. I forget respect the law. It's one of those rules that unless you are purposely thinking about it, you will always forget about. I also then go on to decide that I'm better off shaking off the stun result and then hopefully getting the chip back in the bag. But I fail again. Ridiculous. So he's pinned again. That's his turn done. Ugh. Respect the law probably would have really helped. Basically you roll your cool test and for every special result you get you can pin a character. So that could have really helped me this turn but I missed it. Right with this 
punk we are gonna start running away he's injured he's gonna try and run away it's the busy streets so we gotta roll 2d6 he rolls a double two that means he stumbled he only gets to move his basic move minus one because he's injured so his great escape has become the great stumble and he runs away a mere five inches showing his back to judge kinsey he did not get as far away as he hoped usually it's the dice plus you move twice so that pathetic five inch move really isn't going to help him out next is another red token we're going with the pistol and chain dude he's going to run he does slightly better he gets a three and a one sadly you only keep <laughs> the one result but he does get to move his move to a distance twice plus the d6 so he gets a bit further away i did that wrong didn't i look at that i only moved him his move plus the one dice i should have done move twice so he should have been further away should have been at the crates wow this is the joy of uh coming back to the game after you've made errors hey these things happen though right last punk she is just gonna shoot she's come on she's ready to pop some judges 10 inch range she's got a shoot of four going into this plenty of hits look at that three hits luckily kinsey got rid of the stun result otherwise he'd be pinned now we go on to evade and we get absolutely nothing again he has been shot in the back ganger is eyeing up a powerful weapon into the back of kinsey this is not looking good we get oh, just one damn it that could have been deadly that could have easily took out the judge this turn so judge gets a free defense but because it's in his back he loses one and he rolls two making that a minus one so he takes no damage the punk runs in sprays some scatter shot and it just pings off the judge's armor that is the end of turn two that was real quick right we're getting into this now turn three kinsey's looking a little bit better he's got rid of his stun he is pinned though got two perps fleeing one of who should be further away than he actually is and then he's got the one perp behind him this is the turn where you have to focus as a judge you have to take out one of the original three and they're running away from me at the moment so i know i'm gonna play munch for brains as the judge and that hits him so he has to pass a cool test which he does so that card did me absolutely nothing if he'd have failed he would have had a pin it would have slowed him down which would have been nice but instead he's fine right he's gonna try and run again he does better this time so double move plus three inches which for a block ganger is quite a stunning 13 inch run so he is disappearing off the table or he is very close sorry he is like one turn away from getting out of there up next comes the judge right realistically we gotta try and get rid of that pin first and then we can see what we can do and we're good we got rid of it he also scored three hits on that roll that would have been pretty damn tasty this turn i also remember respect the law so i got two punks within range i'm rolling my call of four i get one 2000 ad and i'm gonna pick the punk behind me to suffer from the pin result that's just gonna slow her down maybe loosen up any chance of me getting shot in the back again kinsey is now gonna take a short move to walk forwards and I'm gonna shoot this punk in the back now as we all know he should have ran so in theory the punk would be at long range not short range here what that means in game is that I should have been at minus one so I should have only been rolling three dice so I rolled an extra two which was naughty of me the punk did not evade I'd like to think that I would have still rolled at least three hits maybe <laughs> maybe two if i'd have got two or three hits he would have still had the same result going down into this so i've only actually scored one power on the hit 
the guy's got to defend. He's been shot in the back though, so he only gets the one. And he misses. So the judge is hit and wounded. I feel that's a pretty standard result, even with three dice. I think we'd have got a similar outcome. And there we go, he took a wound. Nothing too crazy there. Right, we're gonna see if we can get the chip back in the bag. And we do not. That is three turns in a row. Kinsey is not good at putting stuff back in the bag. Right, it's obviously gonna be a punk's chip. So we're gonna use the lady at the back here with the shotgun. Does she get rid of the pin? She does not. She is currently out of 10 inches, I do believe. So I've got to walk her forward. And that is the end of her go. Short and sweet. We got one chip left in the bag. It's the guy who just got shot in the back. That's me remembering that he should have been pinned based on the rolls that I'd achieved. To get him pinned, you'd only have to get two hits. So two hits at three dice isn't unbelievable. So he most likely would have been pinned and injured. Right, so final punk to move. He's going to try and get rid of the pinned result. And he does not. So he wastes his first short action on getting rid of the pin. And he's got to get away from the judge as best as possible. So we're going to put some distance between us. And that is the end of turn three. Turn four, the final turn. We obviously have the one error with distances, but we are going in to what will turn out to be the final turn of the game. All right, first chip out the bag is the punks. First choice I make is to just calmly walk the injured stump gunner off the table. Looking back, I probably should have done pistol and chain, but the thought of getting this guy off the table excited me too much. Next chip out of the bag will be Judge Kinsey. He is eyeing up that injured ganger. He has to get rid of them. But first we do respect the law. Only one in range. And he got her. Nice little 2000 AD popped up. Give her the pin marker. Hopefully that will slow her down enough. Do I get rid of my own pin marker? I do. Look at this. It's coming up Kinsey at the moment. All right, I got two actions do snapshot twice or I could do an aim shot. I think snapshots will be my best bet. It's gonna let me shoot twice. So I'm at long range, shooting him in the back. I'm hitting on freeze. I get it right this time, but I roll three hits. Beautiful. Automatic pin as that beats his cool. Let's see if he can evade. He's only got the one dice and he fails. This is not looking good for the punks. And I only get the one power though. Damn. Right, if he can roll an armor dice. Oh no, I just remembered. So he loses one for his injury and he's getting shot in the back for one. So he's automatically hit by one, which is an injury. He's subdued. So that's game over. Judge wins. Technically I've took out two. I don't think the result would be any different because of the mistake with the moving. But yeah, there you go. That is game one. I hope you enjoyed. Hope this proves that the game is pretty simple. There's enough rules in there that as one player you can forget them. Two players, this game is so much easier. I recommend finding a friend and playing this game. So drop me a comment, drop me a like, drop me a subscribe, watch these videos and I'll catch you soon. Cheers for watching.